Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Zaitsev, and I am founder and CEO of uh, Percona, the company which specializes in uh, open source databases. And uh, not a surprise, that is what I'm going to talk to you about. And I'm uh, going to talk about the change in landscape uh, of uh, open source uh, databases from uh, two dimensions. Uh, the dimensions uh, one is uh, what is going to be for open source uh, in general, right? And the second one is what is going on and changing landscape in a database uh, uh, database mm, uh, database technology, right? So let's talk uh, about the uh, free and uh, open source uh, software, and uh, I will uh, use uh, uh, those uh, terms. Uh, uh, interchangeably for the rest of uh, those presentations, because I believe while there are some uh, you know minor differences between attitude of those organizations, for uh, most of the people uh, it is uh, pretty much uh, the same. So let's look briefly at the um, history of the uh, open source uh, software. Now, one thing uh, which was very interesting for me to discover as I was uh, looking uh, at that is what if you uh, look at the history of the software, the first software was uh, open. In the early days, their software and the hardware were uh, bundled. And because the software worked only on uh, the hardware of a particular vendor, right, there was no point of uh, keeping it closed. Right? Even more so, the early adopters, which were using the computer systems of the early days, uh, really uh, could help to maintain that code, to fix bugs, uh, add functionality, and so on and so forth. And that was uh, really valuable for uh, the companies at that time. And also the changes were actually uh, openly shared according to academic principles of sharing knowledge, because a lot of uh, early days computers were used in, in uh, that space. Now, if you uh, look at uh, development in the United States, at least, uh, there uh, IBM had to unbundle software and hardware in part to uh, in response to, uh, response to the antitrust lawsuit, right? So uh, it doesn't have kind of compile complete uh, monopoly, right? And doesn't allow other folks to produce software for its hardware because, well, they can't compete because software is kind of given for free. Uh, another important thing what happens here is what computer software uh, becomes a copyrightable item in the United States, which it was not, right? Now, one interesting thing I was uh, looking at this uh, here, uh, uh, trying to uh, get some more locally approved information. It looks like uh, things uh, in um, East Germany continued uh, this way for a uh, much longer time when uh, computer software was not copyrightable, right? And it was uh, allowed to be uh, freely copied because of that for uh, many years afterwards. Well, according to Wikipedia, at least. Uh, then uh, computer software becomes copyrightable item that really created a multi-billion dollar software industry we know uh, today. And really create the proprietary software as a major class of intellectual property. Many companies uh, 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 rely on, whether they are directly in the software business or just build something for uh, use in house, right? And that comes us to the second stage of the uh, open source uh, software, right? Which I would. Uh, call that uh, uh, era of uh, romantic open source and a free uh, software, uh, right? Uh, this is uh, one of the leaders, uh, Richard uh, Stolman, which uh, I am sure uh, some of you um, have uh, heard about. And I picked this picture because for some weird reason, he's uh, wearing the corner logo on his head here. I mean, 
I don't know why pure corner didn't exist at that time, uh, for sure. Uh, the best illustration for that era, I think, uh, can come from this uh, book uh, Linus uh, Torvalds uh, uh, wrote a few years later, which was talking about why he created Linux, and that was just for fun. It was not something like, oh, I saw the market need, and I thought I could create a multi-billion dollar industry, right? That was not uh, really the reason, right? Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, reason to create, to contribute open source uh, at that time uh, were really mm, driven by uh, by making, uh, making a difference more than uh, making the profit. Now, if you look as we transition to 2000, we can see the rise of uh, open source. That can be seen in, in a different ways, right, from the famous uh, quotes uh, from uh, Steve Ballmer, uh, the uh, Microsoft CEO, uh, at that time calling Linux uh, um, cancer. Well, thank you for noticing. To uh, the big exit at that time as uh, Sun was uh, uh, Sun acquired MySQL for a uh, for billion dollars. Right, right now there are many open source companies which are worth uh, many uh, billions of dollars. But at that time, the billion dollar acquisition for open source company that was phenomenal. You know, no, no company until. Uh, Red Hat uh, really uh, uh, got there. That also uh, was uh, creating an era where a lot of businesses really recognized the value of uh, open source and really started to embrace the open source uh, first approach, right? Their open source uh, software is seen as a better choice than proprietary software. Everything is being equal. Now, if you look at uh, uh, open source as a uh, software engineer, right, an open source uh, community member, you often will see, will value that uh, for a lot of uh, intrinsic values such as uh, you know openness and freedom. Well, if you look at the business. Uh, we see open source often used uh, because of uh, mm, of a different reasons, right? It, from a business side, it's all about the costs and the ROI. And the open source software offers you both direct uh, lower costs, right? Because you don't have to pay ransom to somebody like uh, Oracle, right? That also makes your cost easy uh, lower because a lot of engineers, software developers, uh, folks operating systems now prefer uh, open source, and that means it's uh, often easier to find the engineers, and they're going to better engineers if they love open source. Open source creates better productivity. It creates faster innovation because you don't have to rely on a vendor, which may be uh, moving at a glacier pace to innovate and to change your software, you can uh, uh, do it yourself. Like, for example, in uh, MySQL space, again, database is very close to me, we could see when MySQL was uh, moving slowly as it was digested first by Sun and then later Oracle, companies like uh, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, and few others, uh, would uh, enhance MySQL for their needs independent on a vendor. And also we at Percona could uh, create an improved MySQL version called Percona Server for MySQL. We could not have done that if that's the proprietary software. And also what is very important uh, here is uh, avoiding software vendor, uh, vendor locking, right? That is uh, really very valuable, especially uh, that is seen by the enterprises which has been there around the block for a long time, many decades. They have uh, often seen as uh, Oracle came about the market as this kind of nice company which saved you from big blue IBM's dominance and locking with hardware and software combined, right? But um, in a decade, 
it uh, the, in a decades it transitions to be very well described uh, uh, by uh, this quote what Oracle doesn't have customers Oracle has hostages because people are so much locked in with Oracle database software uh, they can't really leave that right and having a software lock in is really very uh, important kind of uh, uh, strategic blunder right or strategic weakness because this way you will have a, a vendor pretty much dictate you your uh, pricing and in many cases the uh, technology roadmap which uh, comes from that okay now if you look at the next generation of open source many companies have been started as businesses first right it was no more about uh, uh, romantic ideas about uh, uh, the open source but that was often about hey how can we get the company uh, uh, here uh, right to uh, really make uh, a lot of money uh, and a lot of those companies uh, they are of course venture funded they are founded by the venture capital and uh, with that we really need to provide very high returns and very high returns fast right if you are familiar with uh, the vc industry is it's not an industry which is interested in making the trees greener right and uh, you know uh, world peace uh, this is the industry which is focused on making money for uh, uh, their partners right and typically because they uh, invest with a very high risk, right? Most of the ventures expected to fail. Then they really need to uh, uh, to uh, to get the high returns and and very fast. Here is, I think, what is the interest and what has been happening. Uh, it was uh, trying to mix the attractive message of open source, which, as I said, and was understood of the businesses as uh, the better choice. They the classical uh, uh, their business uh, growth strategies, such as build a monopoly, avoid commoditization, increase stickiness, build anti-competitive modes, all these kind of things you learn in a business school. But if you think that uh, it is a very much against uh, the early days or traditional uh, romantic open source software values, because it's not uh, about uh, the, you know creating stickiness. It's about choice. It's not about anti-competitive. It's about a cooperation with uh, uh, different folks, mostly uh, often with your uh, with your competitors. And uh, also, that really creates a huge variety of not quite open source uh, software as you would see, which can uh, use open source, right, or some other similar uh, wording like open uh, or something in uh, or free in the marketing, but which will not provide you all open source software value, such as open core, when you would have both mm, commercial uh, and uh, sort of crippled uh, open source versions of the same software, you will have open source eventually, then you will have outdated version of the software uh, uh, the, as an open source, right? Outdated, insecure, and unmaintained, I would add. Uh, and then uh, the actually supported version as a proprietary. There is variety of a shared source licenses, then you can see the code, maybe use that in some condition, but, uh, uh, conditions, but it's not fully compatible with uh, open source. Uh, right, and also there is an open source compatible software, right? And let me talk about that open source compatible software maybe mm, a little bit more because I think that is the most, you know, confusing for a uh, number of people. Now, open source software is a proprietary software which claims to be compatible with some open source software, right? So, for example, in our database space, Amazon Aurora. For MySQL is compatible with MySQL. Amazon Aurora uh, for Postgres is compatible with Postgres, right? Now we have to understand what that um, uh, compatibility means, right? 
And uh, what I like to call that is uh, Hotel California compatibility, right? Because it is compatibility which is really designed for you to be able to move to this technology easy, but you will have a hard time uh, moving back once you really adopted it to the fullest potential. That's maybe some additional functionality it provides. It's maybe extra performance, extra security, have ability, some other things, right, which you may not even know or uh, know what you're uh, what you're using, right? And uh, this is not to say what that such technology should not be used, uh, right? Actually, uh, the op uh, there is a lot of a very good uh, open source compatible uh, technology. It is just what uh, you need to understand what you're getting in. And if you really value being able to uh, not to use that technology, you make sure your application is being uh, also tested and validated with completely open source uh, solution, which I know many folks do not do, right? And then when we try to do it a uh, couple of years later, we find uh, it is actually quite hard now to uh, go back and uh, uh, avoid all that locking they created unknowingly so. Now, if you look at that uh, not quite open source um, software, there is a lot of positives here, right? Uh, which really, with venture capital and other really allows a lot more investment and a higher pace of innovation. If you look at the last decade, there is so much great stuff going on in open source uh, well, and in, in, in generally in database space, which would not be uh, uh, possible uh, without that, uh, perhaps, right? And a lot of that investment, it uh, spills out to the uh, fully open source solutions. Like, for example, uh, if you look at uh, their MySQL space, right? Of course, uh, Oracle is uh, investing in MySQL so they can sell MySQL enterprise subscription. But while doing that, they are doing fantastic uh, their uh, MySQL Community Edition, right? Which gets probably 90% of their features or even more of what are being uh, developed overall, right? And the bad thing, of course, here is what it doesn't provide uh, the, all the values of a true open source, uh, open source software. As the next stage, uh, started in 2010, well, likely uh, uh, Amazon was founded, IWS Web Services was founded in 2006, but I think it's, it really only started to significantly impact uh, open source in uh, 2010s, right? If you look at the cloud and open source, we see there is a lot of uh, tensions out there. Right, uh, you have been following this industry for the last uh, few years. There is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, fear, concern about hey, what the Amazon among other clouds are uh, really just free riding their open source, uh, you know, open source software, not given back or not uh, given back uh, enough. Well, in reality, I see that is what these are uh, businesses. Right, and they are uh, using the open source uh, software according to its uh, license uh, in many cases, which, however, was not really designed and prepared for uh, the cloud age. Right, like for example, in the MySQL space, right, and uh, uh, the uh, companies uh, similar to uh, to MySQL, they are relying on the GPL software say uh, with the idea if you want to build uh, something as a non-open source software which is a derivative work of this open source uh, software you will need to buy the license version right as with um, uh, that is called the dual license model which MySQL uh, pursued or even better uh, you will have to release your modified work as an open source. If you think about the modern day with Amazon Web Services, the uh, already named Amazon Aurora, 
is really the derivative work of GPL licensed by SQL. But because software is not distributed, because the software is simply accessible uh, right through a protocol while hosted and managed by a cloud provider, Amazon doesn't need to distribute their uh, Amazon Aurora as an open source or pay Oracle any unlicensed fees, right? And of course, that is uh, uh, not really uh, which was uh, accounted for, right? And those folks design their business model and their licensing strategy. Now, what happened with that is what we see a lot because of this cloud danger, we can see a lot of uh, uh, and uh, mainly public or and venture funded companies have changed their licenses, at least for some of their software product from the open source to the source available licenses, typically some sort of anti-cloud context, just preventing the Amazon from having uh, uh, their software and running that, right? But of course, while it is positioned to everyone as, hey, you know what, we are this uh, small guys and we are uh, looking to have this, you know, 800 pounds gorilla, uh, Amazon Web Services from eating our lunch, it also impacts uh, users and customers with software much deeper because that really locks you in if you uh, want to can uh, to uh, use the particular server uh, particular features right or particular uh, variant or, or particular way to use the database, namely from yeah. database uh, as a service. Now another thing which is uh, which is interesting, which happened with the cloud, is what now we have uh, uh, the things being bundled together once again, right? So if you think about uh, before the cloud, if I would want to run uh, their MySQL uh, somewhere, right? Often I would have a server priced uh, so separately. Right, then there would be some hosting provider charges. Then I have the operating system I'm running, right, which I may go and support it or may uh, go to the vendor, something like Red Hat, and there is a MySQL, right? All those pieces, they are uh, they're, uh, they're separate, right? And um, in the cloud, you are just buying cloud, and that's uh, all. Uh, all combined, uh, right, as a single price right now, and you know more uh, can really see uh, very easily how that uh, price uh, come about. And that means what if for uh, open source software, uh, we have been losing that uh, zero price effect. What is a zero price effect? Well, is what we as a human uh, typically uh, have a very significant difference in our, our mind and the, the price point where something is free and something is uh, paid, right? Even if it costs a dollar, right? Because just some act of paying for something versus using it for free, right? Serves as a, uh, as a barrier, right? And I think that was uh, one of the uh, values of uh, open source, especially at their uh, the, by the by the developers right and folks who uh, you know don't get a lot of uh, a lot of money to spend now wherever I am uh, using the open source or on the cloud right for example I have a uh, Linux powered VM or if I am running a Windows powered VM well uh, in both cases I have to pay something per hour it is just what the price is slightly different right but it's not uh, so large now another thing which is uh, very interesting which has been going on in the uh, in the space is the cloud databases right or database as a service which is uh, obviously much easier to use than do-it-yourself open source solution right so if you think about using amazon rds for example, which you just can spin up in a few clicks and it's kind of uh, provides some limited availability automatically, does backups, you know, automatically patch itself and so on and so forth. 
uh, and uh, just doing that for uh, with the open source components, it is significantly easy. And easy is obviously very seductive, especially for a lot of developers, which can be all under pressure to deliver the features where businesses need, uh, right? Where companies hire and need, rather than uh, you know the, doing the um, doing the cool stuff, right? And that is, of course, uh, is uh, there uh, the, uh, the, the, the danger which uh, for open source software, if you will. The even bigger one, I would say, is what uh, the not fully open source software is really quite uh, accepted in uh, in the market, uh, and uh, uh, that is not a problem itself, right? Because uh, it is fantastic to have a variety of software available, right? Proprietary software, open software, some sort of not quite open source software. But the danger is, is what the value of open source software may be eroding, and a lot of people do not quite understand the difference between uh, what is a truly open source software and what is open source compatible software, and why you should choose one over another. Okay, now let's look at this um, current uh, decade and see uh, what's going on now, and maybe make some prediction about the future, which as Niels Bohr says is not an easy uh, thing to do. Now, if you look at the open source, especially commercial open source software and uh, right in a database space, we can see the great momentum for open source software. Red Hat uh, remains their biggest success story of open source, right? With uh, you know, acquired by IBM for thirty-four uh, billion dollars, right? But you can see there are um, quite a few companies in the space which have uh, public and private, which have uh, mm, uh, valuation of a very, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the, which have a very significant uh, valuation. What is also going on right now? is that there is a lot of innovation in the open source database space, which I think is uh, uh, is, uh, is very cool, right? And again, uh, many companies uh, here, they don't release everything as an open source, but still they give a lot to their, uh, to their open source. Now, as you uh, all know, we are uh, going through uh, the, uh, worst pandemic in a in a hundred years, and what we see is what uh, that is uh, is very good for uh, open source because it uh, does accelerate digital transformation. In many cases, people need to go online more faster. In many cases, while they are also under financial pressure, and that really uh, puts the put the open source. Uh, to uh, the front line, right? And uh, I see that uh, as the dust settles, that will be very helpful for open source uh, databases. Now, I spoke about the database as a service uh, a, a bit already. Now, what I think is interesting about uh, database as a service is uh, as uh, uh, folks, especially uh, developers uh, got a taste of that, that is increasingly becoming a very preferred way to consume the database software, whether that's been open source databases, right, or not, uh, right? Uh, and uh, we see a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, traction here. One of the values what uh, this database as a service uh, approach provide is also that allows engineers to Mm, use a multiple database of uh, technologies better matching the application needs. Because if you think about that, if you take some uh, you know exotic database technology and you say, well, now I, uh, to deploy that for a mission critical application, I need to figure out how to provide availability, back it up, maintain its security, and so on and so forth, right? And a lot of stuff. Now you can probably deploy it in a few clicks uh, and have. Uh, their database vendor, 
uh, or a cloud vendor take on all that maintenance on themselves, and you can just use the database as you want for your application. The reality, though, is while many cloud vendors they market as uh, database as a service, as uh, fully managed, it tends to be uh, over marketed. Right? You would see uh, what. Uh, while database as a service takes away a lot of toil, you still need a lot of uh, choices to make, right? Like, for example, you may have uh, heard and seen amazing number of uh, database leaks from open databases uh, right, uh, right now over the last uh, year or two. And a lot of that uh, really uh, comes to, uh, to this database as a service stuff, because uh, uh, you still have somebody uh, uh, to to manage security, right? If you have uh, a developer who, for example, can't connect to a database, right? So if you just to make things easy for you, for himself, make it publicly open to the internet, right? With some uh, the insecure password. Well, guess what, right? That is a problem. While uh, uh, currently, it is uh, you know typically developer responsibility, not a cloud, uh, uh, not a cloud vendor, right? There are uh, other issues which comes from developer and choose a user database directly without the supervision, right? For example, uh, the costs, right? You would often uh, find because it's so easy to deploy the databases in the cloud. Uh, uh, now, right, or scale the instance, right, instead of uh, requesting a new hardware and waiting for three months for that to be deployed, you can actually scale the instance size in a couple of clicks. Uh, we often uh, uh, see the databases running highly not optimized, a huge amount of waste. In many cases, with uh, even uh, rudimentary optimizations, you can reduce footprint for free. Uh, to 10 times, right, which is just not bad, which is both bad for a company's uh, budgets and uh, then for mm, uh, environment. Now, as I think about uh, cloud, uh, I think we have uh, two models of the cloud which are being really uh, evaluated uh, right now, uh, right, or uh, approached the same way. One is cloud as a commodity, right? That is often uh, often cloud, especially in the early days, was compared to something like electricity, right? And electricity is a commodity. You can buy electricity typically from uh, multiple vendors, and it has uh, no difference uh, for you, right? You can choose and change it very easily. You can look at the cost, right? Or maybe you have some other preferences, right? Like buying electricity from uh, environmentally friendly uh, vendor, right? But uh, it's uh, easy, right? And um, uh, we can uh, see example, uh, for example, uh, things like uh, S3, right? Which became standard as an open uh, standard, right? All the big cloud implementations, there are some many comparable compatible implementations like Minio, right? And if you're relying on such technologies, you can move your applications easily. The other thing, and that is where uh, you would see a lot of cloud vendors are pushing you, is a highly differentiated cloud, which is designed to lock you in on as many properties, technologies available from a single, uh, single vendor. And if you look in this case, for example, what Amazon well, uh, uh, well architected is, it really talks about using a lot of those features they mm, they built, and uh, which of course uh, they are proud of, right? And they uh, recommend to you rather than uh, having, for example, Kubernetes-based solution, which allows you mm, to uh, to really deploy your application. Uh, on-prem or on a variety of clouds. I think a good uh, thing here is what in the grand scheme of things, nobody wants to be in, in hostage, especially uh, as I uh, mentioned with that uh, Oracle 
uh, Oracle, Oracle example like in uh, many large uh, enterprise has uh, uh, been here before. So what we see um, happening with the databases from uh, the change in landscape is what we are uh, getting to what you can call their uh, multiverse. Right? You would see uh, folks using multiple database technology. You'll have relatively few companies saying, oh, we only run Postgres, right, or MySQL, or whatever. Typically, it will be a large number of uh, different database, uh, database technologies. And also, especially for the larger enterprises, they uh, tend to embrace a multi-cloud and a hybrid cloud, uh, right, uh, for all variety of reasons. Some of that is the lock-in, uh, which I mentioned, either could be uh, based on the government regulations and realities. If you're a multinational, which has to do business, uh, uh, you know, uh, worldwide, then not uh, in every country is the same um, cloud vendors may be uh, available or, uh, or acceptable, right, for business or uh, particular re uh, reasons. All right now, if you look for this approach to multi-cloud, we have many proprietary solutions available. Right, Google has Anthos. Then there is like solutions from VMware, AWS Outposts, Microsoft has their solutions, so on and so forth. Right, but at the same time, uh, we have a Kubernetes which emerged as a leading open-source API for hybrid and public uh, cloud. Now, what is interesting with Kubernetes, because it has been initially created for stateless applications, the Kubernetes is uh, often had a bad rep with uh, databases, right? Initially, it was very impractical and dangerous to run the uh, very much stateful databases on Kubernetes. But uh, the modern uh, Kubernetes has become uh, you know, quite better and increasingly uh, you can uh, run the databases mm, mm, database on it. Now, what is also interesting with um, uh, with Kubernetes uh, is what uh, you often uh, would uh, uh, get. Uh, it's kind of not black and white, right? Being you know completely open source uh, with Kubernetes, or you know going to the proprietary solution. Uh, in many cases, you can use uh, Kubernetes uh, interface uh, while maybe use some proprietary solutions to simplify the Kubernetes management and kind of uh, really pick in the right position for you of that open source uh, and uh, simplicity scale. So if you think about the open source uh, databases, right, what uh, uh, we see has been uh, uh, going on, right? And what is important, very impo important to continue doing. One is it's important to adapt for cloud native deployment in multi-cloud and hybrid uh, uh, hybrid cloud solutions, right? Not all databases have a very good uh, solution for that right now, especially in open source mm -hmm. space. Uh, Kubernetes API is uh, obviously the API of choice, uh, right? Now, what I think the next thing which needs to be done is really to build the simplicity, which is uh, compatible uh, to their integrated database as a service solution. So you can really uh, deploy the Kubernetes-based open source database with few clicks and have it automatically patch itself, backup itself, and so on and so forth, right? The major values uh, which uh, uh, open source databases, uh, uh, which cloud databases uh, provide. So uh, the question to ask, uh, what I would uh, recommend if you are using database as a service, uh, right, uh, uh, to ask how you can get the most valuable open source provide in, uh, in this reality, right? And that may uh, refine your choices, you may uh, want to choose something which is kind of slightly more uh, complicated, but uh, which uh, gets uh, a lot of uh, value. From Percona's standpoint, we are uh, working uh, according to the rules, right, in this uh, open source uh, software world, uh, right? We have uh, operators for MySQL, 
uh, with a Perconex CDB cluster and for Perconex server for MongoDB, uh, with MongoDB, which allows you uh, to run those, as well as Percona monitoring management, which doesn't do much for management yet, but it really uh, uh, provides your, your functionality to monitor your databases quite, uh, quite, quite conveniently. Okay, that was about the open source piece. Now let me uh, talk in a few words about what is the landscape and changing uh, going on in the database uh, database technology. Now, if you look at the historical view um, in this case as well, you can see this kind of interesting resurgence. What all uh, everything new is kind of for old, right? If you look at the early days. There was really a lot of fragmentation and data model and query language, right? Frankly, a lot of database implementations were kind of built in in the applications, and you know, so data model could be uh, essentially whatever application design. As there have been a variety of query languages, uh, right? Uh, experimented uh, with and so on and so forth. Now, in uh, uh, 80s, uh, uh, 90s, we see the dominance of relational database and SQL as a, as a query language, right? I mean, even uh, in the early, uh, early 2000s, right, I remember uh, after uh, .com, uh, .com crash, right, if you look at their new, uh, new technologies, uh, new companies coming up, right, all of them have been Mm, using, you know, just few relational databases, right? MySQL, Postgres, that was uh, pretty much it, right? And uh, and there was not as much choice to choose from from mature database to begin with. Now in the uh, uh, 2000s, especially the 2010s, uh, we have a lot of innovation in both the data models and query uh, query language. Have a lot of custom database built rather than a general purpose. Now let's look at the trends uh, which are driving uh, those changes. One is what developers and architects are empowered to make choices about the database to use, right? I already uh, spoke about that. And the cloud makes using multiple database technologies easier. Another interesting, uh, uh, more technical, uh, things to consider is one is we have a lot more microservice architectures rather than the monolith uh, which uh, has been in existence in a uh, in a past decade and uh, each microservice uh, typically is able to make its own choice and what is the most appropriate data store for its needs right which creates explosion of those uh, uh, databases. We also are much more at peace at the concept of a multi-store when the same data it may be stored uh, many times, right? In so many cases now, instead of saying, hey, we'll store our data in, mm, let's say, MySQL, and that's the only database we'll use across all our teams, we can have um, mm, their uh, data which gets into MySQL and then through something like Kafka, it may be uh, replicated to Elasticsearch for full text search query, uh, full text search, uh, right? The queries which is suited better for that in MySQL, and then also at the same time to something like ClickHouse for large scale uh, data analysis, right? Or to Snowflake BigQuery, right? You uh, you, mm, you choose it, uh, right? Oh, all of those. Uh, goes back to that trend of a multiverse what I have been uh, uh, speaking. Now, we also talk a lot those uh, days about SQL and NoSQL. Like those are kind of two uh, competing terms, right? And almost like two religions which you have to uh, follow. You can also describe it kind of as relational and non-relational as an uh, as an other terms. I think it's interesting to see uh, now, uh, what is interesting about NoSQL is it is not some particular database technology, protocol, even uh, data uh, store format, right? 
it is everything which is uh, not relational and uh, why is it so it's interesting to see at the ranking of uh, popularity which come from uh, DV engines right and if you see the fair ranking category you can see what relational databases they still uh, account for majority of the uh, of a use uh, right in in, uh, uh, in this case that is why uh, the, this uh, split of relation and non-relational makes sense right but then uh, in reality you see a lot of uh, different types of a noise well database which are often uh, purpose built and this is only one slice of that right because even for uh, uh something uh, for databases you may have a slice of hey relational databases i've been looking at the row store versus column store right those are typically both relational databases but have a different use cases uh and uh, and uh, so on right or in memory databases right or gpu accelerated databases you can see a lot of those other ways to uh to to group them here is another uh, interesting thing which shows about the growth, right? And you can see with something like uh, time series databases has been uh, growing over the last uh, two years, uh, you know, just uh, mm. explosively. Their relational database are kind of uh, relatively uh, stagnant, right? So uh, or you can see a lot of uh, development and innovation happening beyond general purpose relational database. Now, there are a couple of questions which I think are not answered yet and maybe will be answered over the next uh, few years. One is, uh, uh, is about uh, relational model and SQL. There are kind of two uh, approaches uh, to that. Some co companies, they break away uh, and provide completely different data model, right? Like maybe MongoDB if it's, uh, you know, dog store. And then another provide extension to SQL uh, relational data model, right? For example, uh, JSON functionality in pretty much any relational database uh, those days. Now, interesting enough, what folks who uh, uh who break away with relational database and ask uh, and sql they often kind of have to then go back and add something similar to sql as a language because it's so popular right like for example cassandra ha has uh, cql right or cowgb has n1ql right and a few others which uh, really uh, leverage of that uh, dominance and so many people know in SQL. All right. And I think the interesting is uh, uh, where are we going to run, uh, learn about the multi-purpose databases versus multiple databases which simply store uh, the data multiple times and keep synchronized, right? So for example, uh, there is a multi-modal databases Right, which can say, hey, just store all the data in us and we can be a relational database and key value store and graph database and so on and so forth. Right? Or hybrid transaction analytical databases saying, hey, there is no need to move the data to your analytical data store. You know, you just uh, run both your operational queries and, and analytical queries on the same, mm, same database. Uh, then other question, which I thought is uh, interesting, is this kind of scale up and scale out, right? Scale up, that means, hey, your database is kind of uh, focused on a single node for operation, something like MySQL, Postgres, right? There's a kind of traditional scale up databases or scale out. The databases like Yugabytes, uh, uh, you know, CockroachDB, uh, Cassandra, right? They're really designed for uh, uh, for scale out, right, for running on a large number of nodes to, to begin with, right? And the question in this case is if there kind of room for both of them, or do we really are uh, moving in a world where uh, we will only have a database which uh, really can be run on large clusters very efficiently, and your classical scale out, scale up database will need to 
adapt or, mm, uh, or die. Now, here is what is uh, interesting going on with the architecture trends with, uh, uh, with uh, landscape, which is, uh, has been mm, important. Uh, one is we have uh, increasingly more databases, and I think like all the new databases, or majority of the new databases, uh, they come with uh, locally distributed in mind, right? Not think about the key single server, think about how they can work on the cluster of servers, right, from almost day one. A lot more technologies are also looking at geographically distributed, right? And the reason out there is if you really operate geographically, you have uh, a lot higher latency, like for example, between US and Europe, right? Or uh, Asia and so on, right? You often would often have some data governance questions. For example, you may say, well, the uh, data of uh, US users have to be stored on US and data of uh, uh, you know, German users on European Union soil, that is something what Geo distributed databases really uh, think about. Uh, there is also a lot of work with cloud native databases, which are really uh, designed uh, uh, to uh, run on the Kubernetes as their operating system, not the conventional operating system like, uh, uh, like Linux. Uh, one uh, uh, architecture trend, which is not really uh, connected to open source soft uh, software, but in database in general, is that there is a rise of uh, public cloud only, you know, massively scalable databases, you know, DynamoDB, Cosmos DB, you know, and uh, so on, uh, right? Which uh, you can only run on a selected uh, selected uh, public cloud, and uh, right, which do not have even kind of proprietary software which you can install and maintain on your own if you uh, if you want to now another interesting trend which uh, uh, we see uh, uh, kind of uh, utilized for many new database engines in a separated storage and compute right so that means uh, what you can scale uh, your storage right in many cases something like s3 compatible storage and you compute for processing independently rather than uh, in the same way as you uh, have with you know conventional uh, conventional databases and also hardware acceleration is a bit uh, a big trend in the uh, modern days right uh, a lot of that is focused on the analytical databases for example use of uh, you know, of a GPUs but also on um, uh, the storage level right we have uh, increased uh, like pretty much all the storage vendors or large storage vendors have some sort of smart uh, storage where you can offload some of the computational stuff maybe compression maybe filtering to uh, to the storage right and uh, uh, for me the, uh, the hope here is what we'll get some sort of open uh, uh, protocol here created because so far a lot of uh, those technologies they would use kind of proprietary drivers right and then you will have to uh, really lock into that some particular hardware from some particular vendor if you want to utilize that which is well uh, not a great from uh, logging standpoint well uh, anyway as a summary, you can see what there is uh, a lot going on in the open source database space. Uh, and it is really the great uh, uh, time uh, to be uh, involved with uh, uh, open source uh, uh, databases. So uh, if that is your interest, please do that. And also, as I mentioned, as a big dangers I see right now is devaluation and lack of understanding what the open source uh, software and free software truly meant. So uh, help your friends to understand that. I think we all will be uh, better if a definition of open source software uh, remains, uh, remains the same. That's all I have for you, and uh, now I will be happy to answer some questions if you have any.
Thanks, Peter, for your talk. And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, write them in the chat. Okay, there's uh, one question. In what point encryption at rest are in the OP world? Yeah, uh, yeah, I see that. Uh, well, I mean, the, oh, the encryption is uh, obviously in, one of important uh, components of data protection, right, and, uh, and security uh, at large. Uh, that is uh, one uh, one component of that. In many cases, it's also a question of a uh, of a compliance, uh, right? Which uh, simply is being mandated by uh, some of the policies, uh, right? For uh, uh, data processes, right? For example, if you want to work with healthcare data, financial transactions, and uh, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, yeah, you would. Um, uh, you would mention uh, also may think, hey, if you can act a database, well, we still can, you know, download the data, right? As a if you have a permissions, but that is, uh, well, that is di uh, that is different, right? That is um, for so if you look at the secure security, typically it's designed as multi layer. Uh, protection. There will be one uh, way to protect uh, the data. For example, you know, stolen from the hard drives directly, right? And then another uh, to protect, uh, to ensure only authenticated users can access the data they should. Yeah, so uh, yeah, there is a question from Hendrik about the you know hijacking GPL, right? So um, uh, yes, I think it's an uh, interesting. What uh, there it was uh, is a question: How uh, do we uh, do we protect from uh, clouds uh, hijacking the open source uh, uh, software, right? Um, and uh, should there be a uh, license for that? Uh, there was attempt on this called AGPL license, uh, which I think for years there was an idea what that should uh, uh, protect you from being um, being used in the cloud uh, in a way. But in uh, in reality, uh, it wasn't uh, found sufficient, right? Like for example, we uh, know one of the uh, famous adopters of the uh, AGPL, uh, MongoDB, uh, later moved to SSPL, uh, non uh, open source, uh, the open source license, uh, right? So uh, we'll see how that evolves, right? I think the tough thing with this cloud question is uh, to understand, uh, uh, to see what uh, is it? Is it uh, the question of a software or is it? Uh, Mm, a, a question of service, right? And how you can draw the line appropriately where, as a customer, you can get a value of uh, open source uh, software by being able to use it, uh, right, in database as a service uh, form from uh, multiple vendors, right, not being locked in into that, the uh, right versus protecting the uh, original offer interest, right? I think it's kind of very you know interesting question which has not been uh, figured out but again i appreciate their all the innovation mm, in this case and uh, i think uh, even those not quite open source licenses which you have uh, many they are still better than proprietary software for many users Any other questions? 
Well, uh, the question uh, about uh, Redis uh, wasn't Redis AGPL before we decided it's not their uh, model. So uh, the Redis itself uh, was um, and uh, continues to be uh, 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 to be permissively licensed. I think that's BSD or some uh, or, or, or some similar uh, similar license. It is uh, a, extensions which implemented by Redis Labs, which are subject to the uh, to the uh, to the license uh, to the license change, right? And uh, uh, I don't remember quite what license which was changed for them, but that was uh, first. Uh, there was attempt kind of to uh, add something called the like Creative uh, Commons clause, right? Which, uh, which that, uh, right? Uh, which kind of was added to the Apache license, I think, in that case, to making it not quite open source. But I think there was uh, uh, well a blowback in community because it kind of confused people. Uh, right, it was uh, looked like well, that's almost as good as Apache license, while it's kind of not right. It's like your uh, honey with a little bit of a rat poison, right? Doesn't have a lot of qualities of honey left. Uh, so they did right thing and changed uh, to uh, completely uh, their own license, right? In, in this regard. Right. Uh, if you look at the MariaDB, uh, they have this. Uh, uh, approach uh, BSL, business source license, which uh, falls into what I call the open source eventually. Right? I, um, uh, frankly, uh, do not like this license, uh, right, of this approach. I like it much less than open core. And here is why. If you look at the MySQL approach, you know what the MySQL community edition, while it may be limited in certain cases, it is a very well maintained by uh, Oracle. You see bug fixes, most important, you have a security updates coming on and so on and so forth, right? And um, if you uh, need uh, those additional enterprise features, well, you can choose to pay Oracle, right? Or you can uh, use alternative implementation, for example, from Percona, or you can go and, uh, and build it yourself. Now, what happens in MariaDB case, with a BSL, for example, mass, uh, max scale, Right, what uh, you have the only choice if you want to use a uh, version, even for relatively basic features, you need to buy proprietary version, right? And the only way you get uh, open source is uh, something which is uh, uh, unmaintained, right? You are not getting security features for that and so on and so forth, right? So the open source version of that eventually open source is typically unsafe to use. Right. Of course, in theory, you can say, well, you can hire a team uh, and, uh, you know, maintain that outdated version yourself. But that is impractical for most organizations. Well, uh, uh, the, that's right, right? So if you look at the open source, eventually there is a period of so many years, right? Uh, I mean, it can be three years, it can be whatever, uh, whatever the copyright holder chooses, right? I don't, uh, don't remember uh, what is it for, uh, in, uh, for uh, latest releases in, in MariaDB, Max Scale and other components. Now, to be clear, the MariaDB server, the server component, it's uh, uh, remains uh, GPL, right? It remains completely open source, but there is some extra software like Max Scale, uh, which is uh, uh, which is not uh, not open source in MariaDB case. What is the next database uh, Percona will support? Well, uh, we are uh, looking at some uh, uh, databases, right? But uh, we are not making any public commitment to that. Uh, uh, to that yet. So, a question about MongoDB kicked off all the major Linux distributions. Uh, do you think we'll survive that? So, uh, this is something I think to understand about how many venture uh, funded open source companies operate, right? 
Theost, you are really getting uh, getting a lot of stuff free, right? And that's how uh, venture capital is spent. And then uh, after you get like a, what is called critical mass, then uh, uh, this uh, user base is uh, starting to be heavily uh, monetized, right? So MongoDB is uh, uh, have made that choice with SSPL after they have agree have in their opinion, got uh, a critical mass, right? So, uh, hmm, right, that's uh, fine uh, uh, with them. And uh, the MongoDB focus is a lot that the MongoDB Atlas, as I can see, the cloud-based variant, right? And uh, at least a short term, uh, we can see uh, what the license change uh, at uh, SSPL, they can still maintain the growth at least uh, as uh, their revenue, right? If that is a one could be a public company, so you can steal that. I think that is a very interesting in terms of what that, uh, uh, what will happen in the next uh, three to five years. I think in fact, what MongoDB is now not open source, that creates an opening for some uh, really open source uh, uh, document uh, database, uh, right? And uh, I think it will come out of somewhere over the next, uh, in the next two years, we'll we'll see that. Hey, okay. well, I don't see any more questions coming in. Okay, yeah, thanks uh, for your talk. And thanks everybody for being here at uh, the FrostCon online edition. Um, feel free to join our closing in a few minutes in lecture room one. Ah, there's one more question. Well, uh... I think uh, would we reach a, did we reach a tipping point? Uh, uh, well, I think is uh, what the cloud providers that is uh, is important change which forces a lot of the open source uh, community in a database space, especially evolve in their in their business uh, business model. Right, so that is uh, that is surely a very surely a very question, and I think that is a very important transfer, uh, transformational change in the industry. Okay, well, looks like that was uh, the last question. Mm. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody for uh, attending. That's it has been a pleasure.